The YouTube Gaming Video Guide is available now. Use this fantastic learning resource to learn everything you need to know about making YouTube videos, including how to capture your footage, 3D modeling, visual effects composition, video editing, commentary and audio recording, and more. There is a discount coupon in the description of this video, so grab your copy of the guide right now. How's it going guys? It's the final render here, and I've decided I'm going to recreate the basic tutorial I did on the creation kit back in March 2016, and the reason I'm going to remake this video is because not only have I learnt a lot more about the creation kit since I did that, but also the video quality was a bit bad, the picture quality was a bit bad, so I'm actually going to recreate that video with a bit more information so that you guys can go ahead and get started modding Fallout 4 or Skyrim Special Edition. So, I've got lots of questions on the last video, an awful lot of people watched it, and I'm going to try to answer those questions throughout the entire process as well, so let's go. Starting with one of the most common questions, not necessarily on that video, but on the channel I get, is how do you actually get the creation kit? People don't know how to go ahead and actually get the creation kit. Now, a very quick Google search would tell you the answer, but I'm going to show you for educational purposes. You get it by going to the Bethesda.net website. Now, then from the Bethesda.net website, you need to download their launcher. And their launcher is an application similar to, say, Steam or Origin, so that you can go ahead and download other applications from it. So you can go up to the launcher tab on the bottom, on the top right of their website, and you can download the launcher. It is only compatible on Windows by the look of it, and you need a 2.5 GHz Intel Pentium 4 processor or an AMD Athlon 64. 1 gig of RAM and 250 megabytes of space to download the launcher. Presumably that means it is not Mac compatible. Say that quickly several times. Once we have downloaded that, we will be taken to here. This is the Bethesda.net launcher. And this is where we can go ahead and download the creation kit for Elder Scrolls Special Edition of Skyrim or, of course, Fallout 4. So, you'll need to go ahead and log in. This is the same account details as what you would use to go ahead and download mods on your PlayStation 4 or Xbox One, for example. So I'm going to go ahead and sign in here. And then once you have logged in using your account details, you will be able to go ahead and download the Fallout 4 creation kit here. For some reason, the uh, images aren't loading on my web browser. For some reason, we have just changed our modem, so maybe that's why. And we've got the Skyrim Special Edition creation kit. You can also go ahead and download Elder Scrolls Legends, which is a card game, I believe. You can go ahead and pre-purchase Quake Champions. And of course, you can also go ahead and get Fallout Shelter for free on PC. But obviously, we are going to be working with the Fallout 4 creation kit. You can go ahead and install it by clicking that, and then all is good to go. Another question which I've got on a very regular basis is how do I download this on my PlayStation 4 or my Xbox One? A surprising amount of people have asked that. Also, further on from that, people have said, do I need to own Fallout 4 on PC in order to go ahead and create mods for it? And the answer is... You can only get this on PC, and you need to have Fallout 4 installed. This is basically just a piece of software which allows you to look into the Fallout 4 files. If downloading this gave you all of the files you needed, then it would also be giving you Fallout 4 for free. So, you actually do need to have Fallout 4 installed on your system in order to use this. And I think some people might have been under the impression that it was similar to, say, Snap Map in Doom, or was it the Forge Editor for Halo, to where you could kind of make maps and stuff on console. You can't, I'm afraid, people. It is a PC application. So now that we have talked about how to actually get the creation kit, let's talk about how you get started. A lot of people can download it just fine, but they don't actually know how to get started in it because it doesn't really give you any information about what to do. It just sort of opens. So let me talk to you about some of the things that we can see in front of us. We currently have several windows in front of us, and these windows, you can actually move them about as much as you want. The way I normally do it is that these windows that you can see here, I normally move them off screen onto my second monitor, and then I just have this one fill in my entire screen, because you can totally just go ahead and rearrange the sizes of everything. And you can also add new windows by going to view and selecting the window you want. So how do we actually get started and get working with some of our files? Well, to do that, we need to go up to this open folder here, and then we need to click on that, and then this will take us to our data folder. Now, this is where you can see everything you have on your system to do with Fallout 4. That is an ESP or an ESM, an Elder Scrolls plugin or an Elder Scrolls master file. And this is everything for Fallout 4 and all of the mods you have. Now, 
I have lots of mods installed as you can see here, but if you say only have Fallout 4, the base game, no DLC, then the only thing you will see is this one folder right here, Fallout 4 ESM, Fallout 4 Elder Scrolls Master File. And then if you have any DLCs, you will have these ones which are labelled DLC in there as well. But everything else is a mod that I have downloaded, so you might not have any of these. But we're just going to go and open the default Fallout 4 vanilla game. And the way to do that is to double click on it so that this little X appears on Fallout 4. That means we have selected this file saying we want to go ahead and use this file. And then we go ahead and set as active file. Once you hit set as active file, that tells the program I am done choosing the ones I need. That is the one I want. And then I'm going to hit OK. So now that that is all loaded in game, you can see because it has got all of the cells loaded here, all of the kind of loading areas, the levels of the game, so to speak. And uh, it can depend on your system how long it takes. This is a very CPU intensive application because it's got to load basically all of the assets from Fallout 4 at once, so it can take some time. And one thing I am going to touch on before we carry on any further is how to actually do stuff with DLC assets, because if you just try to open up, say, Nuka World or Automatron, by default, it doesn't let you. It says it can't work with multiple master files, which are these ones right here, which have all of the DLC tags on them. So how do you actually go ahead and modify DLC files if it doesn't actually allow you to do that? Well, there is a very simple way to do it. You need to add a line of text to the Creation Kit INI file, which is a file which is downloaded, which has a lot of the settings for the Creation Kit. And when you actually go ahead and download the Creation Kit, it will be installed into your Fallout 4 directory on Steam, or wherever it is that you have Fallout 4 saved. As you can see, we have got the Creation Kit EXE right there. And it will need to be in here in order to access your data folder as well. So say if you download the Creation Kit and you have Fallout 4 installed, but it actually hasn't found any of the data files, chances are it's because it needs to be installed in your Fallout 4 directory. So, how do you actually go ahead and install the options to allow you to modify DLC? Well, to do that, you need to go to this one. The Creation Kit INI, a configuration setup. And you should be able to open this in Notepad on Windows. And you need to add this line of text right here under general. You need to put it in there exactly how it is written. It is case sensitive. If you type it in wrong or you have a capital B, for example, it won't work. So I'll actually have a link to this in the description as well. So you can just copy and paste it into your creation kit I and I should you want to. But when you have B allow multiple masters loads equals one then you should be able to open up DLC assets as well. Because obviously 0 will mean off and 1 will mean on. So 1 meaning load multiple masters turned on, if that makes sense. So we should, in theory, be able to open up another one as well. Let's try opening up Nuka World. Hit says active file and then hit OK. Right, so that is loaded. Again, it took a little bit of time because we are actually working with a lot of files. But if we now go to the cell view, we can see we actually do have Nuka World assets loaded. And it's exactly the same for Automatron, Far Harbor, or any of the Wasteland Workshop DLCs. Because once you go ahead and add that one line, you are able to work with all of the assets inside Fallout 4. So now that I've shown you how to open up the data folders inside the creation kit and arrange your windows, it is time to actually get started. For this demonstration, I'm just going to show you how to basically move and place objects inside the world of Fallout 4. So, to get started, we need to go to a place in Fallout 4 in the render view window. And the places we are going to go are referred to as cells, and these are basically loading areas of the game. So you can basically find all of the locations inside the cell view window. If we go to the world space, for example, we can pick all the places we want to go. We've got Commonwealth there, which is all of the outside areas of the game. So everything that is outside, you can find in this tab. We've got the Boston Airport there. We have got some of the areas of the city. We have got Corvega, Crater House. All these places are outside. But we can also go to interior cells, for example. So these are all of the places inside. So we can go ahead and find a place that is inside, for example. So we're going to go ahead and got the pre-war TV studio. You can actually go there for the guy who's telling the news at the start of the game. Uh, the combat zone, for example. You can obviously go there and find... I believe that's where you recruit Kate, isn't it? But we are going to go 
to the Commonwealth and we are going to go ahead and find a location in Sanctuary Hills for our demonstration. Here we go, here are the Sanctuary Hills exterior. Sanctuary Hills is actually a pretty big place so it has 10 cells. Cells are basically divided up into squares and Sanctuary Hills requires 10 squares of loading area. So let's just pick a random one, let's go to Sanctuary Exterior 03. And once we double click on that, it will start to load the cell right there. So as you can see, it has loaded something into the render view window, which is fantastic, so we can get started. Right, so now I'm actually going to show you some of the camera controls to go ahead and move about in the environment, because right now we're just looking at the floor. So um, we obviously don't want to look at the floor, we want to look around. So where exactly are we? Oh, we're right over here, right in the middle. we kind of got the bridge over there and stuff. Okay, so let me show you how to actually go ahead and start to use some of the controls inside the creation kit to move the camera, which is very important. So, in order to zoom in and out, you will scroll in and scroll out on the mouse wheel. In and out with the mouse wheel. If you want to move left to right and up and down, you will hold down the center mouse wheel and then move it about as you please. Or what you can do, you can hold the shift button and then move your mouse in order to rotate the camera around. And using these controls, you should be able to look at anything you want. But one very useful tip about rotating the camera around is that if you want to rotate around a particular object, you should click on the object you want to rotate around first. Let's say if I want to rotate around this mailbox. I can click on the mailbox, hold shift, and then move the camera. And as you can see, we are rotating around the mailbox, and it is keeping the mailbox fairly center screen, which is fantastic. Some other things we can do if you want to change what we see here. When you actually load up the creation kit initially, it has got everything that is normally invisible to the player, visible to us here. But it can be very distracting and it can get in the way of what you want to do. So to get rid of all of these extra boxes and all of these markers, you can go ahead and hit the M button on your keyboard. And then that makes them go away so you can only interact with the objects the player sees. Some other things you can do is that if you go up to here, you can see there is a toggle lights option. You can go and click on that or hit A on the keyboard. And then you'll go ahead and turn off the lighting engine so you can see everything without shadows and everything like that getting in the way and it kind of gives you an easier way to find things especially if they are in the dark you can go ahead and turn off the lights and you can go ahead and turn them back on again so that you can see what it's like using the in-game lighting furthermore we have also got the sky option if you click on that this is what the game looks like with its sky. Unfortunately, it's it's absolutely horrible weather right now in the game, so it's actually very foggy. But as you can see, if you turn on the sky, it actually heavily reduces the picture quality because it's trying to run everything in this loading cell and the sky at the same time. So I normally have that turned off just for the sake of keeping it easier to run. Furthermore, you can also change the time of day with this slider here. So if we go ahead and turn the sky back on and then change this slider, you can see we are adjusting the time of day. This doesn't actually adjust the time of day in game. It is literally just for us to see in our preview window. So that's a nice little idea that I think a lot of people don't fully utilize. So how do we go ahead and start placing objects and moving them around? Say if you wanted to build a location or add things to a place. Well, we can do that by clicking on any of the objects that we see. Let's take this light post, for example. Let's go ahead and see if we can move that. So if we go ahead and click on it, and then we are able to move it about by pressing E. If you hit the E button, it will give you your X, Y, and Z axes. If you've ever worked in a 3D modeling suite, then you'll actually be very familiar with some of these controls. And you can go ahead and click and drag on the green, red, or blue arrows in order to move them about. So red will be one axis, green is the other axis, and Z is actually on the blue axis. So you can actually put it in the air if you want to. That's obviously a bad idea. Let's go ahead and move it right into the middle of the road, just so we can be definitely certain if our mold has worked. Go ahead and put it right in the middle of the road. Another thing we can do is that if we hit the W button on the keyboard, we can actually rotate it as well on the X, Y, and Z axis. So we can go ahead and rotate it like so on that axis right there. We can also go ahead and do it on this one, spin it around, and of course on the red one to spin it the other way. So we'll go ahead and uh, 
leave it at that angle again. You know, just so that we can be definitely certain that our mod has worked, even though it makes no real sense at all. And now, if you have something that is actually rotated like this, and you want to adjust it, let's say if I want to move this light post directly into the ground, so it looks like it's sticking out of the ground. But as you can see, our arrows are currently facing X, Y, and Z, which would mean it would be a bit of a nuisance to go ahead and do it exactly the way I want. But if I go ahead and select this button right here with the L and the G, it will actually move. And this way I can actually manipulate the object depending on the angle of the object itself, rather than the world. So that's an easier way to move things about should you have things at an angle, for example. Now something else I want to show you as well, a lot of people don't talk about this, but it's something very important, I think. If you go here, we have got our snap to grid and snap to angle options. These are actually very good options for moving things around in game. So rather than just moving things like kind of one pixel at a time, so to speak, like this, I would kind of want it to snap to the floor, wouldn't I, in order to make it easier. So if I go ahead and click on that option there, which is snap to grid, so floors, walls, things like that, then it will kind of automatically snap to locations to make it a bit easier to make sure things are lined up and aren't overlapping, so to speak. And also the same goes for angles. I can go snap to angle, and then when I hit the W, I can go ahead and rotate it to a certain degree. But there is one thing a lot of tutorials don't tell you, and that is that by default, the snapping options are really off. They are way too extreme in the default game, and it makes moving things very difficult. So in order to adjust this, we need to go to this option here, which is the hand pointing at the bit of paper, to open the preferences. Now, I currently have snap to grid set to 16. By default, I believe it is 64. So let's hit apply on that. And then close it out. So now let's say I want to move this stool on top of this table here. If I go ahead and try to do that, it is snapping like crazy to everything because its snap reference is on 64 which is a very high number. We obviously want it to be a lower number to make it easier more precise. See I'm having a real trouble trying to get this to line up on the table and even if I get it in the table it's still floating. So if you go ahead and change it to 16 which I found through trial and error is probably the best one. You don't want to have it on 1 obviously because at that point it's not snapping at all. 16 I find is actually the best one. You can actually get the most amount of rotations and stuff and the most precise positioning with something like 16. And it doesn't always quite work as you can see. So we can go ahead and turn that off and then move it up slightly like that. There we go. With that we were able to snap the stool onto the table very quickly and easily. So that is just one of the kind of techniques which people don't tell you in most beginner tutorials. And you can also do the same for the rotation as well. I have it set to snap to angle 45. So when I rotate at an angle, it will automatically snap to a 45 degree angle. But you don't have to do that. You know, you could do 10, 20, whatever kind of degrees you wanted. So that is the basics of how you move the camera and also place objects in the world. But how do I go ahead and get a new object so I can place that into the world? Well, we can do that with the object window. The object window is what has all of the items in the game in there. Every sound, every item you can pick up, every quest script, everything is in the object window. So let's go ahead and recreate what we did in the very first version of this tutorial, which I did back in March of 2016. Let's go ahead and get a rug. There is a search bar, as you can see in there. Right, so now we have the rug, which I've just searched up, and everything that has rug in its title, even if it is not actually a rug, such as metal corrugated single blue, for example, has R-U-G in the word, so therefore it is turned up in the alphabetical search. But if we go ahead and grab this, the static daisy rug, so this is a static object, meaning it is an object which doesn't move, or rotate or anything, it is just something to place in the world. You can't pick it up, you can't interact with it. It is just an item in the world. And we can go ahead and place that rug down there. And now let's go ahead and grab the Deathclaw statue. So let's go ahead and type in Deathclaw. So we just typed Deathclaw into the search and everything relating to Deathclaws is in here. Even just for Deathclaws themselves. So if we go ahead and double click on that for example, we can take a look at it. That is the NPC model of a legendary glow in Deathclaw, actually. And if we wanted to, we can go ahead and place that dude in there. But that's an actual Deathclaw. 
So when we actually start the game, we load up the game, this guy will be in Sanctuary Hills roaming around ready to slaughter any settlers here. So let's not do that. But what I want to show you is how do you actually find objects in the object window a bit easier. As you can see in the form type here, everything has a form type. And a form type is basically what kind of item it is. So for example, if we go ahead and click on the form type, it will actually arrange everything alphabetically according to form type. So all of the static items are together. If we go here, we have got an object called LS Deathclaw Gauntlet. And we have also got Creature Deathclaw Run Forward. But it's a static object. So what does this mean? This means that this is a Deathclaw that doesn't move. It is a statue. And you can see these in game. These are the statues of Deathclaws that you can see in the loading screens of the game. So now we have placed this Deathclaw into the world. And when we go ahead and load up this mod, this Deathclaw will be here standing on the rug. And as I said, it is a static object, so this doesn't move. But we can go ahead and grab other things as well. So for example, in the object window, we have got the weapons tab right up here. So all of the weapons related to Deathclaw, i.e. the Deathclaw gauntlet, we can go ahead and drop that right there. So there is a Deathclaw gauntlet in the world now, but seeing as it is a weapon type, not a static object, we can interact with this gauntlet right here. We can pick it up and start using it. Something you can do with objects that you can interact with, such as weapons or items you can pick up, like food and meds and stuff like that, when you're actually placing them in the world, you would normally have to slowly place it down on top of a table or something, right? Not actually, no, because these are what is called Havoc Settled, which means they actually have physics inside the game world. So if we want to, say, drop it on top of this mailbox, we can go ahead and click on this option here with the HK. That will turn on the gravity physics of this object. So if I hit that, it has just moved a little bit because we dropped it on top of the mailbox. If I go ahead and do it again, there we go. It is now fallen on top of the mailbox. So that's actually a very quick and easy way to go ahead and place objects onto tables and stuff like that if they're objects you can pick up or move around otherwise, such as what do we got here? We've got a football over here. So if I wanted to place this football somewhere in the world, say if I wanted to place it just about there, but obviously it is floating in the air. If we save this mod, that would be floating in the air. So what would we need to do is hit Havoc Settle. And then it will roll to wherever it needs to go. Very good way to go ahead and place things on tables and stuff like that to make sure you Havoc Settle them. So that's basically everything I'm going to show you in this first tutorial. As I said, this is kind of a, a high quality recreation of the very first tutorial. But one thing I'm going to show you is how do you actually get this mod in game and how do you start working with it. So what we need to do... We need to save this mod. So why don't we go to File and then hit Save. And then once you have done that, you can go ahead and name your mod. Let's call it Test because that is what it is. And then hit Save. So now that has actually been saved and we are able to turn that on using whatever mod organizer we normally use for our modding. However, I'm also going to show you how to go ahead and upload it to Bethesda.net should you actually want to go ahead and release your mods onto PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. To do that, we need to go to File and then hit Login to Bethesda.net. And then once we're here, we have got to sign in using the same login we did to get the creation kit at the start, our Bethesda.net account. And then once that is done, we can go ahead and go back to File and then hit Upload to Bethesda.net. And once we are there, as you can see, we have got the PC, Xbox One, and PlayStation 4 options. So why don't I go ahead and hit PlayStation 4 right there. So these are some of the other mods I have created and published. And I need to hit the one called Create New Mod. And then once it is there, you can go ahead and give it a title. Let's call it Test. We can go ahead and write a description. Tester Mod. And then we can go ahead and give it like some random categories. Again, I'm not really going to put too much effort into this. But you can go ahead and name it, write a description so that people can go ahead and download it and tag it with everything you may need. And another thing as well is that you can actually export the info as well. So say if you've written a really long description and you want to upload it to PC, Xbox One and also PlayStation 4, you can go ahead and call it the test. So next time when I need to go ahead and import the same description rather than typing it again, I can just do that and hit open. Very easy way to actually go ahead and do it. Because imagine if I wrote like a 500 word description and I wanted to go ahead and add all the same categories and all the same text to the Xbox One version, I would have to type it again. 
But if you export your info and then import it, then you'll actually be able to go ahead and get it working properly. So then you hit create and then it uploads. Upload complete. Let's go ahead and finalize the mod on Bethesda.net. So as you can see here, the test mod actually is on Bethesda.net and we can go ahead and open that up for example. As you can see here is the test mod. It is not published yet. When you actually go ahead and upload it, you need to come onto here, make sure all of your description is correct, your title is correct, and then hit publish. Once you hit publish, then people can see it on their PlayStation 4s and Xbox Ones, etc. So if you were to go to the edit tab, for example, you can go ahead and add all of the images of your mod, add videos. You can also go ahead and add any requirements and stuff like that, known as dependencies. Now, very important thing, do you remember at the very start of the tutorial I showed you that if you want to work with assets from Nuka World or any of the DLCs for example, if you make a mod and you have those ticked, the person who is downloading the mod must have those DLCs. If they don't have the DLCs, the mod won't work. Even if you load up the say Nuka World assets, but then don't actually do anything to the Nuka World assets, you still won't be allowed to download the mod. The PlayStation 4, for example, will not allow it to run because you do not have the dependencies. So, if you do include a DLC, make sure that you make it clear in the description and in the titles and also in these tabs here that you actually do require that DLC, otherwise people will get very, very angry. So now that I've actually created the mod and is on my computer, I'm actually going to test it on the PC version and you need to basically go ahead and install it the same way you install any other mod. In my case, I actually use Nexus Mod Manager, but there are other mod managers and stuff you can use. Heck, you don't even need a mod manager. You can do it entirely yourself if you want to, but I like to use Nexus Mod Manager. And as you can see, the very bottom plugin is for test.esp. That is the one that we just made. So if we give that a tick and then launch it, we can see if it's worked. Okay everyone, so here we are in the PC version of Fallout 4 and as you can see, our mod has fully worked just fine. We have a Deathclaw on a rug. Consider yourself a champion of modding. Obviously, I didn't actually go ahead and put the rug directly on the floor right there. So these are obviously things where, say, the snapping would be an important thing to do. So you could go ahead and highlight the road and then snap to the road, for example, rather than just doing it quickly. And the Deathclaw obviously looks like a deathclaw. You obviously saw that someone just walked directly through it and that is because whilst this is a static object it doesn't actually have any collision. That's just something to do with this object in particular. If we go ahead and start to look around and stuff, we can walk on the rug because that does have collision but the statue does not. And uh, we have also got our deathclaw gauntlet there. We can go ahead and move this and stuff and we can go ahead and pick it up. And uh, where's that ball? Oh, the ball's rolled off somewhere. Oh, isn't that a shame? It is a ball after all. And if we go ahead and enter this house here, we can see our stool is still here. Yep, that's still there, all right. And uh, it looks like it still works, actually. Can I say? Oh, dear. <laughs> okay, okay, get off the stool, get off the stool. There we go. All right. So that is actually how you go ahead and do the basics. Um... As you can see, there is lots of stuff currently missing from my game, but don't worry, that's not because of the mods, that's because I built this place in Sanctuary Hills maybe, ooh, maybe a year and a half ago, and lots of those mods no longer exist, so therefore a lot of these settlements don't exist. Yeah, this is a ver probably the second episode of Building My Mods this place, and most of it is completely ruined. But anyways, that is how you go ahead and do all the basics of modding. You know, how to open up the files, how to go ahead and export a mod, how to add objects to the world, how to upload it to Bethesda.net. I showed you some good basic stuff there, and I hope you really enjoyed it. If you want to know more, then go ahead and let me know. I have done other tutorials on the creation kit that are a bit more advanced than this, and of course the Building With Mods series that I do has an awful lot of creation kit builds in there, so you can see the creation kit kind of fully in action, and what you can really do with it. So everyone, thank you very much for watching this tutorial video. It's been a bit long, I know, but this has been all of the basic stuff. And I wanted to remake it with higher picture and sound quality. And also answer some of your guys' questions. So, thank you very much for watching this video. Remember to go ahead and check out all the cool Patreon people in the description below. Who help support the channel with their financial donations. You yourself, of course, can also do the same. And I'll see you around. This has been the final render. And you've been the audience. Bye bye for now.
The YouTube Gaming Video Guide is available now. Use this fantastic learning resource to learn everything you need to know about making high quality YouTube gaming videos. This online video course on Udemy currently has over six and a half hours worth of video content to teach you everything you need to know about how to make fantastic YouTube gaming videos, including how to capture your content, how to edit your content, how to record your audio and commentary tracks, how to create fantastic thumbnails and animations used in visual effects composition and 3D modeling, as well as some film theory and film history. You will also learn how to use some of the best equipment on the market and some of the best editing software on the market so you can always be up to date with the latest trends and technologies. There is a fantastic discount coupon available to you. Use the coupon code Google to get a huge discount when you go to buy the course. So what are you waiting for? Learn how to make the best YouTube gaming videos right now. The only thing left to do after that, of course, is nav mesh this place and we have got a finished Halloween party. Smaller video I know, but I think it's a really, really cool idea to go ahead and have the Hell's Bells to be part of your game. It looks absolutely glorious. We got loads of cool fire lanterns and I really love the aesthetic.